All right, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I guess that it's only like 15 of us. Uh, feel free to interrupt me uh, if you have any questions. Um, so yeah, so today I would like to talk about uh, near surface seismology and more specifically what we can do with ocean bottom DAS. So this work has been done with uh, Zach here at the University of Michigan, uh, Mathieu Berton, who is uh, in Mexico, Jorge, who is a researcher at Google, Yaolin Biao, who is a PhD student in Zach's group, Fabian, who is a researcher, a professor at the University Gustave Eiffel, and also some uh, researchers from the uh, ERI in Tokyo. So um, this is what I wanna talk today. So first I'll give a brief introduction and then I will dive into uh, imaging shallow uh, marine sediments using earthquakes and also uh, the ambient seismic field or seismic noise. And then I will uh, go through this part here that is characterizing the linear and nonlinear behavior of sediments um, during strong ground motions before some uh, conclusions. So instrumental seismology is relatively new. So most of the data that we are using right now have been collected in the past 50 years. And this is mainly because during the past 50 years, we made a lot of improvements in terms of uh, instruments and also storage capabilities. So right now I'm gonna show you a video of the number of seismic stations uh, through time and also the number of earthquakes that uh, have been recorded. So here we go. So here, the inverted triangles are the seismic stations, and this is from the uh, 80s to uh, pretty much now. And what you can see is that we have a lot of earthquakes. We have more and more earthquakes um, that we can detect when we increase the seismic network. So here I'm gonna play it again. So at the beginning, we don't really detect any earthquakes because we don't have a lot of stations. And as we increase the number of stations, we uh, can detect more and more earthquakes. So this is uh, the final map as of uh, the end of 2017. And what we can see from this map is that we have a lot of station on shore. So in the US, we have, for example, the US array. In Europe, we have quite a lot of stations. Same for Australia. But the problem is that uh, oceans cover 70% of the Earth's surface, and we don't have a lot of uh, seismic networks uh, that are deployed offshore. So the biggest problem with deploying sensors offshore is that you have to uh, face pretty critical conditions, so very high pressure. Also, you have to deal with a lack of power supply. You have to you need batteries to basically power your instruments. And there is also a problem with data transmission from the seismometer uh, or the instrument at the ocean bottom and um, uh, data centers on land. So we have existing options still to uh, get an idea of what's going on below the seafloor. Uh, one of them is to use those big ships with air gun and streamers. Uh, those air guns will just uh, generate some very strong acoustic waves that can probe the earth and then be recorded by streamers that are uh, following this boat, uh, for example. We can also use OBS. So here is an example of an OBS that we just drop in the ocean and recover them after a few months or a few years. Or we can also use this kind of uh, device here. Um, they're called mermaids. So they will just uh, drop into uh, to a certain depth. And once they record a P wave coming in from an earthquake, they will surface, send the data, and then drop back at a certain depth. So this is not uh, an exhaustive list. We have way more um, options to do ocean bottom seismology. But uh, the prime is that everything is really expensive. So for example, for all, to deploy all those sensors, you need a ship with a dedicated crew. So everything is really pricey. The instruments are also pretty pricey. In case of OBS, we tend to lost quite a, lose quite a lot of them uh, during campaigns. So uh, it's pretty hard to do uh, cheap science on the ocean bottom. 
So now I'm going to uh, focus in Japan where they have quite a lot of money to do that and for pretty good reasons because they have a lot of subduction earthquakes that uh, can threaten uh, populations in Japan. And in Japan, they de develop those uh, cabled arrays. So here along the non trough, you have the two-net array, so with two uh, separate networks. And recently, uh, the S-net network was deployed. So uh, they are quite different. So for DUNET, uh, those dots are pure seismometers that are buried in the ground. And the data are transmitted in real time to uh, the shore through uh, fiber optic cables. And for SNET, it's basically a long fiber optic cable with repeaters to um, reamplify the signal every uh, 20 to 50 kilometers so that, for example, an, um, sensors that is right here could transmit its data all the way back to uh, the shore. So in those repeaters, they installed accelerometers, I think also velocimeters, and I think some of them also have tsunami gauges as well. And the great thing with those cables is that uh, they are uh, fiber optic cables. And with the DAS technology, we pretty recently realized that we could use that uh, to also probe the Earth. So turn those fiber optic cables into very dense arrays of sensors. Uh, one thing I should mention here is that uh, if you're interested in those data, they are all publicly available on the NID website. You just need to log in for that and you can have access to all those data. So, um, now I'm going to give a brief intro to DAS. I'm not sure it's really necessary because I know that a lot of you um, work on this already, but just in case there is people who do not know what DAS is. Um, so basically what we do with DAS is to use an interrogator unit here. So here's an example of a Phoebus interrogator. And those interrogators will simply send these pulses down the cable at the rate of a few thousands uh, pulses per second. So here's an example of a uh, laser beam going through a fiber optic cable. And uh, basically what we do is to record um, the backscattered light. So the, some of the light is backscattered to the interrogator and we measure that. And if we have a change in the medium, so either a seismic wave going through or a car passing by, that will basically change the phase arrival um, of the backscattered light. And by analyzing this difference, what we can do is just um, integrate that over a certain length called the gauge length to um, convert those time shift into strain or strain rate all along the fiber optic cable. And the great uh, part of this technology is that we can turn uh, fiber optic cables into thousands of uh, sensors. So for example, here we are in Spain and there is this cable between Valencia and Palma. And during uh, our experiment here, that was about two weeks, uh, this magnitude 3.6 happened. And you can see that the seismic network in this region is pretty sparse. They only have four stations. But with DAS, we can turn those 50 kilometers here into 3,000 channels or stations, uh, which is pretty, um, it's a factor almost 1,000 uh, compared to the current um, seismic array that they have in this region. So here uh, in this presentation, I'm gonna be talking about uh, ocean bottom cables, and there are quite a few experiments. I know that uh, at Nice, you have been working on a few of them. Uh, I guess the one right here, or the one in Greece as well. Uh, there are cables of for Belgium, Japan, uh, Spain, California, and um, uh, this is not a final list. There are way more experiments. So I know that uh, they are recording some data in Alaska. Jan is also going to be working in Chile. And so I'm pretty sure there are way more experiments than just this. But in our group, we have uh, three data sets. So this one in Japan, this one uh, that I just showed offshore uh, Spain, and we also have four months of data offshore the Oregon coast here in the United States. 
So in this presentation here, I will be exclusively talking about this uh, cable deployed in Japan. Um, so here I'll just uh, say a few words about uh, what we have learned from those recent experiments with this. So we know from those uh, recent studies that we can record microseisms, so basically uh, the interaction between ocean waves and the solidors. And we can also record what is going on inside the water column, so for example, currents or tidal interactions. We can also record earthquake, er, earthquakes as well as uh, acoustic phases. So for example, T phases. So a T phase is simply a wave that is generated by uh, earthquake waves, so seismic waves that uh, are converted into acoustic waves. And if those acoustic waves are trapped in the so far channel, they can travel thousands of kilometers. Uh, so for example, in Japan with the Sanriku cable, Yaolin uh, Miao, the PhD student, was able to detect a T phase that was generated by a magnitude 4.8 or 5 in Chile. So uh, Chile to Japan, it's about 12 or 13,000 kilometers. And that was pretty incredible that we could record this type of signal. Um, and of course, uh, ocean bottom bass can be used to image the Earth. So here in this presentation, I will be uh, imaging the Earth using earthquake waves, also using uh, the ambient noise or ambient seismic field. And I will be also focusing on earthquake ground motions and try to investigate how the shallow layers of the Earth response, respond to those earthquake ground motions. And as I said, we'll uh, be focusing on this uh, cable in Japan. So this cable is about 120 kilometer long. So it's in northern Japan, right above basically the Toku Oki uh, rupture area. So the magnitude nine uh, that happened in 2011. And this cable was deployed in 94 to sustain this um, array of seismometers and uh, tsunami meters. So here you can see that the um, Inverted triangles are the OBS stations, and we have also two tsunami meters. Um, the landing station of this array was completely damaged by the Toku Oki earthquake. So the tsunami just wiped out the landing station of this um, array. Fortunately, they were able to recover the fiber of the cable and restore the entire array um, in 2013 or 2014. And uh, in 2019, they installed a DAS interrogator for about two weeks. Uh, that was uh, in November. And um, they recorded the data, they probed the cable with a sampling rate of 500 Hertz. The channel sp spacing was five meters. The gauge length was 40 meters. But basically what we did is to turn the first uh, 50 kilometers into a very dense uh, array. And as I said, we recorded the data for 14 days, which uh, gave us a um, data set of 20 plus terabytes. So uh, here in the second part, which is imaging the Earth with earthquakes, I will be focusing on the very beginning uh, of the cable. And then for uh, imaging the Earth with noise and uh, for the uh, site response analysis, I'll be focusing on a, um, a slightly longer part of the cable here. So uh, we're pretty fortunate uh, that during those 14 days of data, we were able to record a lot of earthquakes. So we have hundreds of earthquakes that have been recorded. What I'm showing here is only the earthquakes which have a really good signal to noise ratio. Uh, but basically we can record earthquakes from magnitude 1.1, I think to uh, we had a 6.5, which was a very deep earthquake that uh, occurred up here. Um, what I'm going to show you is uh, the waveforms here of this magnitude 2.5 earthquake uh, that happened basically right below the cable. And what we can see is that we have a clear P wave for this earthquake, then a clear S wave. And what is pretty striking is that the ground motion lasts for um, quite a long time for this type of earthquake. So here we have a 
um, the ground shaking for over a minute for a magnitude 2.5, which is pretty unusual. So here that brings me to uh, um, the first part of the talk, which is imaging the Earth with earthquake. So in um, ocean bottom death data, what we uh, realized is that we had a lot of Sculpty wave packets. So Sculpty waves are simply relay waves that travel at the solid fluid interface. And here is an example of one channel. And you can see that we have quite a lot of different wave packets that uh, can be seen. Um, another thing that we uh, have here in this time distance uh, to the coast plot is that we can see those features, those inverted V uh, shapes, which have been thought to be uh, caused by scattering points or faults. Uh, but it's not very clear what it is yet. So here, the idea is to use those uh, Sculpty wave packets and their dispersive properties to image the Earth. Uh, here is simply a sketch that shows that uh, for lower frequencies, uh, those lower frequencies tend to travel faster than higher frequencies. And by using this difference, we can basically um, image the Earth using those dispersive property of surface waves. So uh, this, um, this slide is a little bit uh, dense, but I'll try to walk you through it. So to image the Earth with earthquakes, what we developed is a gridded slant stack. So what we did is simply uh, take those boxes and those boxes we uh, are sliding them uh, over the records of an earthquake. So here we have close to the zero time lag, the S wave arrival that is barely visible. And here we have about uh, six, seven kilometers um, along the cable at the very beginning here of the cable. And this earthquake is this uh, number one earthquake here. So we have those boxes that we slide across the, um, the, the 2D plane here. And for every single box, we compute the um, phase velocity of the waves that are traveling in the window and compare that to the phase velocity uh, of a reference velocity model that we obtained in a previous study. And we do that for a lot of different frequencies. And if the uh, phase velocity for a lot of frequencies matches the one, the reference one, we uh, basically create a heat map by doing that. And uh, so if it matches, we obtain these green uh, areas here, which means that the phase velocity at a lot of different frequencies in this box matches the one um, that is the average for the region. And here we do that um, for the waves traveling towards the ocean, so uh, towards the positive um, number here. And we also do that for the waves traveling towards land, um, so this way. Uh, so that gives us quite a lot of regions where we detect clear propagating Sculpty waves. And then for every single box that we are showing here, we uh, simply compute, uh, uh, we transform this time distance plot into a phase velocity frequency plot. And then we simply extract dispersion curves, so the high energy points, and then we invert that using a two layer of our um, uh, half space uh, model. And uh, so here we do that for 18 earthquakes, and we end up with uh, approximately 600 uh, Sculpty waves uh, uh, packets. And so it gives us basically 600 1D velocity model, then, then we can uh, combined to make a 2D velocity model of the very shallow uh, subsurface here. So here it's the first 80 meters. Uh, one thing um, that is worth mentioning here is that we have some regions where for basically every single earthquake, we generate Sculpty waves, or at least we detect clear Sculpty waves. So in this region here, in this region, or in this region. And uh, so as in those regions, 
Scalty waves are excited for every single earthquakes. What we think is that those regions might be fault zones or at least uh, regions where scattering is very strong. However, for some regions, we do not see that it's pretty random where Scalti waves can be clearly observed or generated. And so to try to uh, explain that, we did some uh, uh, full waveform simulations. And here in scenario A, it's basically an earthquake that is happening at uh, the interface. So here's a subduction zone, here is the surface of the earth, and here we have a water column uh, on top of that. So here I'm going to play scenario A, and it's basically the waves that are being emitted, so P wave, S wave, and you can see that some of the waves are being um, um, uh, trapped into the water column here. And what you can see is that those waves, they kind of bounce up and down in the water column, and every single time they bounce down and hit the seafloor, they kind of generate some waves uh, as well. So here, uh, now what I'm going to show you in scenario B is uh, the same earthquake, except that this time we have an absorbing boundary condition on top of the water layer. So here you will see that all the waves that arrive at the surface of the ocean are just uh, vanishing because we have this absorbing boundary condition. And finally, so this is a scenario C. So to obtain scenario C, and this is exclusively the contribution of the water column uh, during this earthquake, what it simply did is to subtract the wave field from panel A um, from that in panel B, and we obtain scenario C. And here, so we have nothing at the beginning because the waves travel from the, the uh, hypocenter to the surface, but then we start seeing the contribution of those um, of the water column and how the energy that goes into the water column is re-injected back into the earth. And those waves here are basically sculpted waves that are uh, generated by reverberations in the water column. So here is a plot on the right that kind of summarizes what I just said. So here we have the wave field uh, that's uh, A, so the full wave field. So we can see PS, uh, P and S waves. Um, and some uh, S wave converted to water waves and back down into the earth uh, that are now P waves. And uh, um, yeah, and also we have uh, acoustic pulses that go just up and down, and those are standing waves. But what is pretty interesting is that if we only look at the uh, water the water column contribution, we can see that we generate a lot of sculpty waves. And in uh, the synthetics time distance um, uh, domain, we can see that those sculpty waves, uh, when they are generated, they kind of generate also those inverted V shape uh, type of waves. So those inverted V shapes are not necessarily caused by local scattering or fault zones or local amplification of uh, surface waves, but they can also be caused by uh, acoustic reverberations. So here it's like, it's pretty hard now to uh, understand um, if those inverted V shapes are caused by, um, uh, by which phenomena those inverted V shapes are caused by. So this uh, is the end of part two, and now I'm gonna jump into uh, part three, which is imaging the earth with ambient noise. Um, so, here is a brief slide to explain uh, how uh, ambient noise and uh, cross correlation works. So if we have two stations recording continuous signals, um, namely the noise, uh, what we can do is simply cross correlate the um, Fourier transform or, well, we can multiply the Fourier transform of those two recordings in uh, the Fourier domain. And by doing so, we can obtain the wave propagation between the two stations. So here, if we have uh, the sources of the noise that are homogeneously distributed, we will be able to retrieve the propagation from the virtual source here to the receiver, which is shown by the positive part, and also from the receiver to the, um, the virtual source, which is the negative part here. 
Because uh, those stations are generally located at the surface of the Earth, and because the uh, noise sources are also uh, lo uh, localized at the surface of the Earth, those um, correlation function, cross correlation functions, generally only contain the surface wave propagation. But the nice thing is that we can use the dispersive properties of those surface waves to image the Earth. And this is one of the first papers that was um, published. And they use relay waves uh, to image the subsurface uh, below California. So here we are doing the uh, exact same thing, except that we are using DAS. So here you can see that the station spacing is pretty big. Um, those might be like five, uh, 50 to 100 kilometers apart. But here with this, we have one station every five meters. So here is an example of uh, what we have. So here is the channel number. So, um, or here it's the distance between the stations. And here is the time. Uh, when we process the data, we use one bit. So setting positive uh, values in the noise to one and negative values to minus one. And also using widening. So widening is simply setting the energy of every single frequency to one. So we don't have a dominant frequency when we compute the cross correlation functions. I will go back to the one bit uh, normalization in a few seconds because we have tried uh, to process the data with and without one bit and our results were pretty interesting. So I'll come back to that in a minute. But uh, then what we simply did was to take the causal part of those correlation functions here. So only the positive part. And so those waves are propagating towards the ocean. And then we simply computed a slant stack to retrieve, so to transform this time uh, distance um, um, uh, dimension into a phase velocity and frequency dimension. So here, uh, what I'm showing in black is the local maxima in this 2D uh, plot. And what we can see is that we have a lot of dispersive features that can be uh, observed between uh, those stations here. So uh, now I'm going to come back to the effect of one bit normalization on the data. So here it's the exact same plot as I showed before, except that it's for uh, some other stations, but we retrieve basically the exact same features. So a lot of these pairs of features uh, over the whole frequency range that we have here. However, if we don't use one bit normalization, we end up in the uh, phase velocity frequency domain with something like that. So those big lines uh, here, so the um, increasing phase velocity with the increasing frequency. And those lines are basically caused by spatial aliasing. And in our case, that uh, can be defined by this equation here. So V is uh, the phase velocity, F is the frequency, delta X is the spacing between uh, two stations. So here, five meters. And N uh, is the uh, number of stations that we consider here, uh, the number of receiver stations. So here, for example, uh, we have 300 receiver stations. And then I is simply an integer. Uh, here I'm showing the white lines between uh, 0 and 10. So 0 uh, is here. And then we go down up to 10. And um, what you can see is that we match pretty well all those spatial aliasing traces. And the reason why we have this term n here is because if we try to use uh, a different number of receiver stations, so here, for example, we have 200, 300, and 400, we can see that those spatial aliasing lines kind of move up and down. So here, what we observed is that um, using one-bit normalization, we basically are able to increase the energy of the proper signal, and this energy of the signal becomes higher than the mechanical energy of spatial aliasing. And that's why here we are able to retrieve some signal where we are not able to um, without the one bit normalization. I will also come back to that in a minute because even though we are using one bit normalization in the following, in some regions, we still end up with spatial aliasing, and I will come back to that in a minute. 
what we also uh, investigated here was the effect of the number of receivers that we use uh, when we compute those dispersion images. So here, uh, the dispersion image is computed using 100 stations. So here, if I just go back one slide, it's basically the number of stations that we have um, uh, here. Uh, but here we have 100 stations, 200, 300, 400 stations. Uh, here we simply shifted the virtual source location so the middle point is always the same. Uh, here it's the station number 3000. And what we realize is that uh, here the, we can see a few modes, but they are not well resolved. But by increasing the number of receiver stations, we can better resolve those modes. The problem is that it comes at a cost. It's in this cost is um, we lose the lateral resolution of the model. So here we uh, obtain a pretty good uh, results with uh, 300 stations. Uh, one thing I should also mention is that uh, here we create more and more modes uh, when we increase the number of stations. But at station three, well, for 300 stations and 400 stations, at high uh, phase velocity, we do not create more modes. It's only at uh, very low uh, phase velocity that we create more modes. So here we kind of reach a stable point, at least for the high uh, phase velocity part. Um, so here it's this uh, previous point has a pretty big impact in our case. So we did some synthetics uh, to better understand uh, what we have. And here uh, we consider the constant gradient as a shear wave velocity media. Uh, so here we consider two different media. So um, a gradient of two and a gradient of one. So here's simply the depth and uh, the, the shear wave velocity. And then we simply computed uh, the dispersion curves for those two models. And what we can see is that when the gradient is two, we have way less dispersion curves than if the gradient is one. Also, what we can see is that most of the blue lines here kind of match uh, parts of the uh, dashed uh, black lines for quite a lot of um, the dispersion image. What we can also see is that we create some uh, apparent dispersion curves here, which are made of oscillation points of different dispersion curves. And uh, we observe that for a gradient of one and at slightly higher phase velocity and higher frequencies uh, for a gradient of two. But here, I think that the main uh, takeaway from this slide is that we can increase the number of modes simply by increasing the number of receiver uh, stations that we consider. But also, uh, if the gradient in the subsurface uh, changes, that also changes the number of modes that we can retrieve. So here we uh, have to be sure that we process the data in a way that uh, we are sure that we are not uh, basically sampling what is happening in the processing um, rather than sampling what is happening in the subsurface. So here, this is why uh, in the following, we use one bit normalization and uh, 300 receivers. It's because at pretty high frequency, we kind of stop creating modes after 300 or 400 receiver stations. So what I'm showing here is all the dispersion images along the array. So uh, the channel number of the virtual source is shown on the top of each flock. And what is pretty interesting is that after station 5000, we can clearly see that spatial aliasing is uh, dominating those dispersion images, despite the fact that we use one bit normalization. Um, in some other regions, we can see that we retrieve a lot of different modes um, and no spatial aliasing. So here we inverted those dispersion curves. So we don't uh, assign dispersion curves in our inversion. We simply uh, take those dispersion points and then try to fit a certain number of modes and look at the number of modes that can fit or data and basically use that to invert a velocity model. So this is the velocity model that we obtain for uh, about 30 kilometers here. So we can see very shallow, uh, very low 
S wave velocity layers and um, the S wave velocity increases up to a depth of about um, 1,000 meters below the seafloor. And here we have a pretty stiff um, uh, medium. But one thing that was pretty interesting was to look at uh, earthquake uh, ground motions and try to compare that with the shallow part of our velocity model. So here what I'm showing is simply the record of a magnitude 3.7 earthquake. Uh, this is the S wave arrival right here, and the P wave arrival is a little bit earlier, but we do not very see it on this um, image. And what is pretty interesting is that we have those sculpty waves that are being created in two main regions. And what we think is that um, we have for those sculpty waves that are generated here, so this uh, part here is caused by an effect of the bathymetry and also probably because we have a very uh, slow uh, VS structure around here. And this one is also being created by this very slow uh, VS layer that can barely be seen here and also maybe by this kind of feature here. Also, uh, spatial aliasing that we were seeing in the dispersion images are mainly seen in this region. And this region here is basically where we have um, a pretty high, well, it's not very high, but it's higher than in other regions, uh, VS velocity close to the subsurface. So what we think is that we do not see spatial aliasing in this region here because the shallow layers of the ground basically excite uh, surface wave more. So we have more surface wave energy that we can use to compute the dispersion images. But in this region, we don't have the shallow, uh, slow velocity layer that can really excite the surface waves. And therefore the uh, mechanical energy is stronger in this region and can uh, uh, impede our ability to retrieve dispersion curves. So this is the end of part uh, three. And now I'm gonna jump into part four really quickly. Um, so here we wanted to see if we could uh, get the linear and nonlinear response of uh, shallow sediment layers. So here um, I'm gonna start this presentation with, uh, not with this, but with the KickNet network, which is a Japanese network. This station is in Tokyo. And this network has two accelerometers, one at the surface, one at depth, and they kind of know the uh, S-wave velocity profile between those two stations. Uh, of course, it's Japan, so this station recorded a lot of earthquake, and this is a very small earthquake that generated very small accelerations of the ground motion. But what you can see is that the shallow layers of the ground clearly amplify the seismic wave. So one thing we can do is compute the Fourier transform of those two traces and simply compute the ratio between them. And what we obtain is the borehole response. So here, basically, the amplification of the waves uh, that depends on the frequency. And this is directly linked to the subsurface structure. And so for very small earthquakes, the response of the year is linear. So here, if we compute the same um, uh, borehole response for hundreds of earthquakes, and here show the standard deviation, you can see that the standard deviation is pretty close to the mean. However, now if we look at a very big earthquake, that is the Toku Oki earthquake that generated very strong accelerations, we can see that we have a clear deamplification of the waves, and this is caused by an increase of damping in the shallow layers of the ground, and also a shift of those peaks here towards lower frequencies, and this is caused by um, uh, a, a decrease of the shear modulus uh, in the shallow layers of the ground. In some extreme cases, we can even uh, have soil liquefaction, so a complete failure of the ground. So this is uh, the, probably the most famous example. That was the 1964 Niigata earthquake in Japan. In Christchurch um, in, tw in 2011, they also had a lot of liquefaction. Uh, the problem with nonlinearity and uh, for example, soil liquefaction is that it's something that is very local. For example, this car here sunk into the ground, but the car in the background uh, wasn't affected. So as it's very local, it's really hard to analyze with seismometers. So here is the question, um, can we use distributed acoustic sensing to uh, do this kind of analysis? 
So here we are exclusively focusing on earthquakes. So we use 107 earthquakes, which are shown here. And we use them because they have a good signal to noise ratio. And uh, here we have uh, an example of the earthquake. And in the following, I'm going to be exclusively focusing on the maximum uh, peak strain that was recorded during these uh, earthquakes. So it's generally around the S-wave arrival. And what we did was to compute the autocorrelation functions around this maximum peak uh, strain. So the autocorrelation functions gives us the reflectivity response of the Earth. So for example, if you have a P or an S wave arriving uh, close to a site, if you have a low sediment layer or laying a high uh, VS bedrock, what we will have is simply those waves being kind of trapped in this uh, low velocity layer. And by computing the autocorrelation function, we can retrieve the wave propagation uh, right below the station. So here we uh, focus on the maximum peak strain, which is uh, shown here. And we select a 10 second window starting one second before this peak strain uh, after filtering the data between two and 30 Hertz. And then we repeat the exact same thing uh, in different frequency bands. So here the uh, window is fixed but then we simply filter the data into different frequency bands. So here it's, uh, for example, between five and 10 Hertz, and then we compute the autocorrelation function of this window. Then we repeat the process between 10 and 20 Hertz, we have an autocorrelation function, we repeat that between 15 and 30 Hertz, we have another autocorrelation function. And we do that into, uh, in uh, multiple frequency bands between two, and, well, two to four, three to six, and so on up to 15 to 30. So uh, here, what we have is for each station and each uh, frequency band, um, we have 107 earthquakes. So here, I range the earthquakes by their peak strain. So uh, here, it's uh, the, the earthquake that generated the largest peak strain. And what you can see in the autocorrelation functions, so yellow is positive, blue is negative, is that we start seeing a, a decrease of the uh, first trough of this autocorrelation function. And to measure that, what we use is uh, stretching and uh, dv over v. So here we computed a reference waveform, which is simply the stack of all the autocorrelation functions for the earthquakes with a, a very small peak strain. And then we simply stretch or compress this reference waveform and try to find the, maxi, uh, the correlation coefficient that maximizes um, the fit between the reference waveform and every single. Um, autocorrelation functions here. So we do that for 107 earthquakes and all the different frequency bands. So here in this plot, I'm showing the central frequency of uh, the plot. So for example, if the filter was 10 to 20 Hertz, the data are plotted on the 15 Hertz line here. Here um, we have the dynamic peak string during the earthquake for every single frequency. And uh, here I'm showing 107 earthquakes and I'm showing the results for 10 stations. And what we can see is that when the uh, strain is very low, here I think we have a problem with uh, the scale, maybe uh, times a factor 10, five, I think. Um, uh, but um, when we have uh, very small strains, we have no changes over the entire frequency band. However, once the peak strain increases, what we see is that we have a drop of the dv over v, so the um, the, the arrival uh, of the, the first trough of the autocorrelation function is a little bit later. And here we can see that for high frequencies, we see that pretty clearly uh, at high frequencies. Uh, what we also observed is that uh, for stations that are very close to each other, so those stations are only 300 meters apart, uh, we observe clear, a clear um, different behavior between those stations. And for some stations, we do not observe anything at all. So here it means that we are pretty sure that we are very sampling what is happening in the subsurface. So that concludes uh, this part three, and I will quickly jump into the conclusions because I've been talking for uh, quite a long time, I guess. Um, so here we can, uh, I guess we can learn a lot uh, about the subsurface, the ocean bottom subsurface using DAS.
Uh, and there is a lot of room for improvement. So um, the ocean bottom desk can be used for oceanography, port monitoring, earthquake early warning, and a lot of different fields. However, it's not for everyone because first you need a pretty pricey desk interrogator. Uh, there is a no pool of instruments where you can rent or borrow an instrument. And because of the large size of the data sets that are being generated, there is no uh, data sharing platform until now. So here at the University of Michigan, uh, we'll be hosting pretty soon the first public desk data set repository. Uh, so the access uh, to this data set will be possible uh, through Globus uh, Connect. So that's simply a way to download the data, in a, well, a smart way to download the data. And uh, we won't restrict the access to the data. We'll just keep track of the uh, um, institutional addresses uh, of people to, um, that we'll use to log in. And this data set will have approximately 10 different data sets, uh, which are shown here. And we will have approximately 250 terabytes of data. And this should be uh, up and running pretty soon. We are uh, working on this right now. So. Yeah, that's it. And thank you very much.